And good evening. I'm political editor Dennis Welch. This is Politics Unplugged. We're two weeks into the new session of the Arizona legislature. So what have we learned so far about this session and how it's all shaping up? Joining us now to talk all about this reporters, reporters Jessica Bame of Axios and Hank Stevenson of the Arizona Agenda. Hank Stevenson is also one of Arizona's newest lobbyists, but we're going to get to that here in a little bit. All right. Um, but first, let's start about this is really the first kind of full week where the legislature is operating. you got the committees running and bills being vetted. What what kind kind of trends are we seeing emerge here right now when we have divided government for the first time in a long time? Well, I think we're seeing Republicans at the Capitol pretend like we don't have divided government for the first time in a long time. Um, they're going ahead with the same kind of culture war bills that they passed that, frankly, even had trouble gaining traction during Governor Ducey's tenure and mm -hmm. really have no shot of becoming law under Governor Hobbs. Um, we're also starting to see the beginning of a budget fight brewing. Republicans are already talking about shutting down the government come July 1st because they hate Governor Hobbs's budget so much. But I believe that's a lot of political posturing. And at the end of the day, we'll get there. Right. Dennis, right. right. right? I mean, look, we got a long time before <laughs> July. And it's easy to make those threats right now. We'll, we'll unpack that here in just a minute. I just want to ask you, Jessica, what, what's behind this? Governor Hobbs hasn't specifically commented on legislation, particular bills, but she's made it very clear, both in her inaugural speech, her state of the state speech, and in every sense, she's not signing some of the bills that we saw that you know are kind of related to the culture war and stuff like uh, bills dealing with drag queens, uh, bills dealing with pronouns and what you can and can't use in schools. What's driving this? Why are Republicans continuing to hear these bills, as Hanks just said, and pretend like there isn't divided government? Well, you know, for the same reason that for the last several decades, Democrats have introduced bills about gun control that they knew weren't going to pass. I mean, it really doesn't matter if they don't become a law because these uh, politicians are going to be able to go back to their base and say, look, I tried. Mm -hmm. But what's different between now and when uh, Democrats have done this in the past is that Republicans still have control of the legislature. So we're going to be hearing these bills. They're probably going to go to floor votes. They're probably going to go to the governor's desk. And that means that for the next six or more months, we're going to continue to have these conversations. And that's what the Republicans want. They want to have debate about this. They want it to be part of our conversation. So that's what they're doing. It's also a bit of political me messaging, right? They're going to, you know, they're, they're, they're setting the governor up to veto all this stuff and they can kind of use this against her in the future, right? Of course, the governor is the villain for vetoing these things. And you mentioned the governor hasn't commented on legislation, but I have noticed her chief of staff tweeting, this bill is DOA <laughs> when it comes to our office. So yeah. I think they've sent pretty clear messages to the legislature well, about and, what they expect. And if the legislature is pretending it's not divided government, I mean, kind of the same case can be made with Katie Hobbs, Governor Hobbs, on certain bills. And I'm, I'm thinking about the budget proposal where she wants to eliminate the ESA expansion. Um, that's the program that allows public money to, you know, send your kids to private schools. There's no way Republicans are going to agree with that. Is there a, a, a compromise that could be done at the end, at the end of the, by the end of the, the, the legislative session on, on, that, on that issue? There's going to have to be, probably, mm -hmm. um, or the governor's going to have to just uh, pretend that that didn't come up earlier this year. <laughs> uh, but I do think that, uh, you know, in the same vein, the governor is playing hardball, too, and saying, this is what I want, and I'm throwing it out there, but it's a starting point. We all know Governor Ducey had similar things that came out at the beginning of the session, and as time goes on, um, there's always compromise, and, and we're going to have to get to some common ground somewhere. Yeah, yeah I, I was going to say, what, what kind of compromise is out there? Is it something where you can cap the program? Because the ESAs has expanded to now all... Uh, one million kids, uh, students, potential students in Arizona. Is that something that can be capped or is it something else? Because I kind of feel like maybe the best thing that Katie Hobbs can get out of this in a, terms of a compromise is more accountability, meaning that these private schools, these private institutions that take public money have to report more about, you know, test scores, how the money's being spent, things that they may not have to report right now. Yeah, I think there's some potential for kind of tinkering around the edges. Like mm -hmm. you said, maybe a very large cap on the total enrollment of the program, maybe some accountability measures. But at the end of the day, Katie Hobbs is very smart. She knows that the legislature is never going to repeal the universal ESA expansion that they just passed. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, you know, a negotiating point, something to throw out there so that at the end of the day, this will probably not be in any budget proposal that goes to her office and lawmakers were, will be able to say we protected ESAs. Katie Hobbs will be able to say I got some money for other things. 
Um, just the idea that this is going to be repealed is a, a little bit uh, of a reach. And I think that in some ways that, that call has kind of united the Republican caucus. A lot of the moderate Republicans who you might expect to be kind of cozying up to Hobbs or, you know, at least meeting with her privately are really beating their chests right now and saying ESAs, we're going to protect ESAs. So I think in some way that might have to a degree backfired, at least in the short term. Yeah, because I think nationally, a lot of Republicans are pointing to Arizona and that ESA expansion mm -hmm. as a massive achievement and something to build upon. I don't see a lot of room for them to give any ground on that. But um, on, on, on a different front, on a much smaller fight, on a much smaller level, I mean, there seems to be two different um, attitudes, perspectives about when it comes to tax cuts. Governor Hobbs has uh, indicated that she wants to cut the so-called pink tax, that's the tax on uh, feminine hygiene pro project, uh, products, diapers, these kinds of things. Republicans, however, they're moving forward with bills to, uh, with bills to cut the taxes on the grocery tax or the rental tax. How is that going to shape up and how is that going to uh, uh, you know, end at the, at the end of the session? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and the food tax proposal specifically is so interesting mm -hmm. because there is, you know, an argument to be made that food tax is, is unfair, especially to people who make the least for mm -hmm. our low income families, which is why you see some Democrats also supporting this. Mm -hmm. um, but what that bill is specifically doing is it's a, a power grab from the cities, telling the cities that they're not going to be able to decide how they want to raise taxes. Um, and of course, we have a long and storied history with that in Arizona. Um, but I, I don't see that one becoming a law. I don't know. What do you think? Hey? I, and that, that was the thing where, like, you know, Carrie Lake, when she was running for governor, that was, that was her economic plan. Yeah. Her, her plan was, like, get rid of the rental tax and get rid of the, the, the food tax. But however, you, you dig into the numbers of the, the grocery tax, there are certain uh, small towns in Arizona, I'm thinking of Taylor, Arizona, where it's like a third of their budget is dependent upon this grocery tax. You take that away, the argument goes... You know, you know, critical city services could be and will be affected, like police, fire, trash pickup, those kinds of things. I remember last year there was an op-ed saying, you know, cutting the uh, the food taxes is akin to defunding the police because mm -hmm. that is what it's going to mean. Is city services, cities do not have the size budget that they otherwise would have. The vast majority of city budgets are police, fire, things like that. And, you know, if you don't have the revenue, you can't have the expenses. All right. Um, we got about a minute left, so I have to ask you, we kind of tease ahead that you are Arizona's, one of Arizona's newest lobbyists. Yes. You have registered as a lobbyist, and you are trying to get a bill passed that would allow for a memorial of slain Arizona Republic uh, reporter Don Bowles. Talk to us about this idea and, and how's, this, uh, how's it going so far. Well, I don't actually technically have to register as okay. a lobbyist because because nobody's paying me to do this project, unfortunately. If anyone wants to pay me, I will register as a lobbyist. Uh, but yes, Don Bowles was a journalist who was murdered um, in the 1970s at the Clarendon Hotel. Somebody strapped a car bomb uh, under his car. He died several days later. He was murdered for investigating uh, crime and corruption in Arizona. Um, there's no monument to him at the state capitol. That was, you know, his digs. He worked there. Um, and almost 50 years later, his memory is kind of slipping away. And I thought this would be a really fun way to, one, both write about the process of getting a bill into a law, um, hopefully, and two, something that's really great that we could do to uh, memorialize a man who gave his life to a good cause in Arizona and um, who really deserves a place at the state capitol. Uh, and, and, Fonk, do you see any controversy with this? Um, it seems like, you know, on, in general, like memorializing somebody who was slain in such a way like that, just doing his job, reporting on and digging into the mafia activities. But you see any any controversy considering the, the you know, I mean, look, it's the, the relationship between a lot of lawmakers and reporters in the media right now is strained at best. Is there a possibility for any any controversy here? Oh, sure. I mean, some people might uh might say, you know, we don't want to memorialize the media in any way. Um, but I would hope that people could understand the, the significance of this. I worked at the Republic for a very long time. He is very much a part of our uh, collective memory um, and a reminder to do our job without fear or favor. Yeah, and it's a big part of Arizona history as well, because that was something else. Um, anyway, we're going to have to wrap it up right there. Thank you both for joining us here today. Still ahead.